Rach Achalaf, my colleague, the chief scientist uh, of the Ministry of Energy, and I started speaking about holding such a symposium, we thought, what would we like? And what we wanted is for you to be here. We wanted all the experts from around the world, all the, the key persons from around the world working on this specific field, fuel cells and hydrogen, to come here and share from their knowledge, from your, from your knowledge and your experience in this field. We want you to be exposed to the, to the great Israeli science and the great Israeli activity going on here. But we also want to learn. We want to learn how deployment is achieved around the world in this area. We want to, to learn how science is promoted around the world in this area. So we really want to learn from you and we want you to take the time here and listen and learn about the different activities in Israel, in this specific area of fuel cells and hydrogen, but not just, of course, there's a whole summit ahead of us with different, um, uh, with different panels and session on mobility, what, the, what the, the future of transportation will look like, and this is a really, really interesting era we're living on because it's a really game-changing, the trans transportation sector. So what I actually want to say before beginning the first panel is take the time to, to discuss, to learn, to share your knowledge, your ideas, and to keep on fertilizing this great international fuel cell community that has been established for worldwide. And enjoy the day. Now, as two hours to the symposium, um, I want to open the first panel by giving you a brief overview of uh, fuel cells and hydrogen for the transportation sector. So according to a report published late uh, in the summer by Bloomberg, the current number of vehicles by the end of 2015 uh, on the road was approximately 1,500. And the forecast for 2018 will be 10,000 vehicles. Interestingly, Toyota said that by 2020, which is just like, just like a minute away, 2020, it will be 30,000 vehicles. Of course, Japan will be the major player, but 30,000 vehicles just from Toyota by 2020. This is like tomorrow. And, and uh, out of four, a total of 40,000. Now, during the past years, we weren't aware of a lot of launches by the car manufacturers, but what we are exposed to is that there is a very, very serious commitment of the world's largest OEMs that are not only investing in developing these vehicles, but also actually uh, uh, investing in the, in the infrastructure itself. And some of these vehicles are of course the, the, the Hyundai fuel cell uh, vehicle from 2013, the Mirai from 2014, the Honda showcase the, in two, the Clarity in, 20, in uh, 2016, and also BMW leased the i8, Volkswagen began speaking about Passat and the Audi models, Nissan stated it will commercialize 2017. And just lately, I think from a month ago, even General Motors said that they will have the, the new uh, Chevy Colorado, Colorado ZH2, which is an uh, off-road vehicle for the Army for Forces. So we've got the major players in the private sector field already investing and dedicated to this field. Now, an interesting and maybe boosting sector for, this, uh, for the fuel cell is the mass transit, because this will actually help go from the production of tens to thousands of, uh, fuel, cell, uh, of uh, fuel cell components, and this will enable actually to commercialize and lower the price. Um, and with that regard, it seems that China is actually the main player here that has already started to order and implement Ballard uh, components in their trains and their buses, one of, the deal is, one of the deals even speaks about 300 buses in the cities of uh, Fushan and Yonfu. But it's not only China. Uh, we, we heard that Hydrogenics agreed to a 10-year program, to, uh, ten -year program to, su to supply fuel, cell co fuel cells to the Alstom uh, uh, transit uh, train, and we'll probably hear about that later on. 
In addition, more than 30 European authorities stated that they're willing and they're going to deploy fuel cell buses. The, the FCH joint uh, undertaking established consortium of bus manufacturer and refueling stations, all of those involved in the field to actually implement project and this is in order to lower the price. And we've got the players like Van Hool, Evo Bus, Solaris involved in this. But we're still talking about early market challenges. Now yesterday, again, at the workshop in bar -Ilan University, we saw it on the academic level that the fuel, fuel component, the fuel cell components are actually what makes the fuel cell vehicle quite uh, expensive, if it's the catalyst or it's the problems of durability. But it's not just that. It's also the small volumes that they are currently produced at. It's the restricted and immature supply chain. It's the current lack of hydrogen refueling stations. It's the cost of building a refueling station. And of course, it's the, it's the, these stations will be non-profit, especially at today, oil prices. So why go there? Why, why go to this uh, drama? So, uh, uh, Hydrogen, fuel cell and hydrogen are considered to be a very clean and sustainable fuel or alternative. Especially, well, it depends on what the hydrogen is produced from. Some say in a report I just read, if hydrogen were produced from natural, from natural gas, we won't be able to achieve the reduction in the GHD that we're supposed to achieve. But now we're speaking about producing hydrogen from renewables. So it's a very sustainable uh, fuel. In addition, this fuel is starting to be really realized around the world. You know that this is the only fuel that has a national day? In the US, October 8th, yes, it's the only fuel. I don't think I've heard of gasoline having a national day, even though it's much more. 300, yeah. So October 8th, is the, is, it's the U.S. National Day for Hydrogen. Do you know why it's October 8th? Anyone has a guess? You guys don't answer. Because it's the, it, the it, who said that? Who said, it? really good. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got the fuel cell bus, buses being deployed around the world, and we've got launching of new fuel cell models. I, I'm pretty sure we'll be hearing a lot more soon and we're having countries starting to promote national programs. And with that, now we will turn to our first panel, which will actually discuss what are the, what, what are the, um, what are the regional um, sorry, drivers for each country to go into fuel cells? And what are the challenges? What are the barriers? How do the government overcome these challenges? What is the role of the government? What is the role of the OEMs? Should they have a role, the OEMs? And I would like to invite to the first panel my distinguished guest, Dr. Klaus Bonhoff, Managing Director of NOW from Germany, the Organization of Hydrogen Fuel Cell Technology. Dr. Sunita Saitipal, Director of the Fuel Cell Technology Office of the DOE. Uh, Ohira-san, Director of the New Energy Technology Department from Japan. And Mr. Eric Denhoff, until recently, President and CEO of the Canadian Hydrogen Fuel Cell Association. Klaus, other than the UK, Germany is the only country with a more a public station than private ones. This being a, the opposite of what is true for usually when we hear for CNG. Why, why go to this, why, why prefer the public stations over private ones and what is what is the government role? What is there a national plan of, for Germany for uh, implementing fuel cell and hydrogen for the transportation sector? Well, first of all, um, infrastructure is definitely the key for deployment of vehicles. Um, and globally, there's always the discussion around is it uh, the vehicles first or is it infrastructure first? Um, and in the end, you come to the result uh, from a customer point of view, if you don't have publicly accessible, easy accessible hydrogen stations, people will not buy fuel cell vehicles. So um, we started that discussion as early as 2009 actually in Germany 
uh, in the H2 Mobility Initiative, where explicitly we uh, joined uh, the car manufacturers together with infrastructure providers to uh, exactly discuss that question, to, to jointly assess what does it take to build an infrastructure. Um, and early on it was very clear that you have to look at infrastructure builder from a customer point of view. Uh, and if you do that, you say, well, what does a fuel cell vehicle offer? And it offers fast recharging, um, refueling. Um, that's one of the main benefits of fuel cell vehicles uh, compared to other zero emission uh, vehicle solutions. And you just have to make sure that uh, it's an easy experience for the customer to refuel. Um, and yes, it is true, if you start building public infrastructure, um, the very first stations, and we at this point in time are building 50 stations in Germany, 20 are online, and it will be 50 early next year, uh, and we have plans to move forward to 100 in 2018-19 and 400 stations uh, 2023. Um, that those is stations. That is really happening. That that is really. That is the that is the plan. That is the business scope of a joint venture which was founded in Germany, which is called H2 Mobility Germany, okay. um, to build those stations. The first 50 stations are funded by the German government under an R&D funding scheme, mm -hmm. uh, which is ending at the end of this year, and we're now entering to the next phase. And uh, H2 Mobility, as a private initiative is investing to increase that to 100 stations by 2018, 2019. Um, and all of those stations are not profitable. All of those stations do not see enough vehicles to justify the business case. But there is a clear understanding that you need to have this initial network uh, in order, again, for the customer to um, perceive that hydrogen is actually a fuel that is available. So there is always that discussion uh, you want to start build your infrastructure where your fleets are. And you have to look not only at passenger cars, but you have to look into synergies with bus operation, uh, maybe train operation. Um, all that is true, but in the end, it has to be a normal refueling experience for the end user, for the private customer, and that's why we're focusing on these public stations. And, and you said that the first 50 stations were, in, were the government invested in them, is that true? Did, did the did the car manufacturer also play a role in that? In well, we have uh, in this initiative, H2 Mobility, all the major car uh, manufacturers, not only the German ones, mm -hmm. uh, namely Daimler, BMW and Volkswagen, but also uh, the Asian ones. So Honda, uh, Toyota and Hyundai are participating uh, in this initiative. Um, and it was very clear from, from uh, very early on that the network planning itself has to be done jointly because the car manufacturers know where their customers are, and then, of course, it's not their role to build stations. That's why the infrastructure yes. people do this at that point. Okay, and, and what is the role of NOW in the um, organization? NOW was founded as a program management organization in 2008. The German government, together with industry and academia at that time, decided to enter into a 10-year program to do market preparation for hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. And uh, they jointly developed a plan what to do over that 10-year period. And then everybody said, well, then we need a program management organization that makes sure we stick to the plan, we stay focused, we t basically take the public funding that is available and use it uh, in this uh, public-private initiative. So we're something like a moderator, uh, sometimes like a neutral uh, driver of these things, a go-to point. We're steering the public funding mm -hmm. uh, through our evaluation, but we're also actively networking to make sure that things are getting implemented. Okay. Now, Sunita, the, the DOE started with early market applications in order to lower the cost, like the forklift projects. And also, in, in a, most of the stations in the US are located in California, being the major player, and we know that the California is planning an, on adding another 100 stations. Uh, and just now the, the uh, station in Washington, D.C. was launched, by, funded by the government, by the DOE. Uh, I wanted to ask you as a head of the fuel cell technology office and head of the program, the national program for fuel cell deployment, what are your activities? In what, how do you implement this? Thanks, Anat, and first of all, thanks for the invitation. 
Um, it's the first time for me and several of my U.S. colleagues here in Israel. We have a long time history, in fact, in collaboration. And um, as you were mentioning, you know, Israel has been you know, historic for, for many reasons, but also in electrochemistry. And so thanks to Lior and all the stakeholders yesterday for the workshop. Um, so first of all, we have a balanced portfolio in the U.S. And so we're looking at um, electric vehicles, you know, battery electric, plug-in and fuel cells are a part of that portfolio. Um, and in my office, so within, for those who are not familiar with the US Department of Energy, we have um, within what's called EERE, energy efficiency and renewable energy, which is essentially two billion per year, um, mostly R&D, but covers um, 10 different offices, solar, wind, um, vehicles, and then my office, which is, includes hydrogen and fuel cells, and again, most of that funding is R&D. And we see our role is in enabling, in, in other words, um, we, we focus on market and system-driven targets. And so we focus on R&D to reduce cost, improve performance, and uh, also do some demonstration, limited demonstration and deployment activities. To your, so to your question, early on, you know, I think we recognize that it's gonna take a long time for the vehicles um, to come out and to have market penetration. So we looked at how can we enable um, a supply chain, a growing infrastructure, and pave the way for the long-term success of um, light duty vehicles. And so we looked at some early market applications like the forklifts and backup power units for cell phone towers. And through our uh, Recovery Act, um, starting in 2009, we helped to deploy cost share 50-50, um, around 1,600 uh, fuel cell forklifts and backup power units combined. And now we're tracking over 18,000 um, that are being deployed. And so it's, we, we consider that a success story. We're, we're still not there yet. We still have to reduce cost and address infrastructure, but um, we have major companies now, FedEx, uh, even Walmart, for example, placed an order for 1,000 Coca-Cola okay. that are putting in um, fuel cell uh, forklifts, for example. So I think, uh, so in, in general, you know, we have a comprehensive portfolio, the <coughs> R&D, but all the enabling um, Activity. So, for instance, safety codes and standards is really critical. And we've educated over 36,000 code officials and first responders. So, again, paving the way. Um, California, of course, has commitment, state government commitment for stations. But in the Northeast as well, we, we're seeing plans for between 12 and 25 stations. So I think we're, we're steadily seeing progress, um, especially since, for those who are not familiar, we already have fuel cell vehicles for sale in the U.S. and lease. So, you know, we have commercial, the, in fact, um, the 2016 uh, Toyota's fuel cell vehicle is completely sold out. So there's, there's um, a lot of demand for these vehicles. And currently most of them in California, though. Right. So uh, obviously, you know, yeah. they'll go where the, the stations the are. The stations are. But yeah. there's, uh, because in the U.S. we have, from the policy side, we have I think a major driver, we have a number of drivers, but the CAFE standards, and we have the zero emission vehicle mandate. So we have California, but we also have eight states that have committed to over three million zero emission vehicles, which include fuel cell vehicles. So there's a lot of interest in the, in the Northeast as well. Mm, that's right, yeah. Uh, and now there, there were, as far as I remember, there was a study in California with the OEMs in order to understand how many how many stations to build depending on the amount of vehicles that they, s that they will produce. So that's, that's, that's right. Uh, now, here is some, it, it, there's a statement of the Japanese car manufacturers that, and it makes a lot of sense, that they will go and s sell and lease in the places where policy is promoting it, where there's a original support. Now, Japan, according to a, a report released by the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, Japan is aiming to have 40,000 hydrogen-powered hydrogen vehicles by 2020. How does the Japanese government aim to reach such a goal? Do me tell. <coughs> How to achieve the target 40,000 uh, MCV or 800,000 stocks in, uh, by the 2030? 
Uh, actually, the, <coughs> the uh, private sector OEM's activity, but uh, <coughs> we'd like to support uh, to, 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 to accelerate OEM's activity. There are a lot of challenges you know, for the FC fuel cells. Um, <coughs> Uh, we recognize that uh, there's a lot of barriers or challenges in front of us. That may, uh, for <coughs> I have to mention for the of the fuel cells, uh, we recognize that uh, there are the three major challenges for the fuel cell to, to be solved. One is improving the efficiency. Now we have the uh, 30 to 40 uh, platinum, 40 gram of platinum for uh, catalyst for the FCB. We need to, to reduce it one tenth by 2030. Uh, it's uh, almost the same size of the uh, tailpipe gas catalyst itself. <coughs> and challenge is increasing efficiency to 10 times compared to the current level with keeping durability. Uh, other one is improving the durability. Uh, current durability is uh, 5,000 uh, 5, hours. It's enough for the uh, passenger vehicle, but we need to improve it 10 times to 50,000 for not passenger vehicle, but commercial vehicle, like bus, sure truck, etc. And the other one is uh, productivity. Um, well, uh, productivity is the main issue. So in Japan, we need to, to wait uh, for, to have the FCV almost three years. Three that years. That means <laughs> now we just you know, order now, we get the FCV in the 2019, something like that. That's the issue of productivity. We can, they can, Toyota can produce the uh, uh, <coughs> 2000 this year, 3000 next year. So uh, we need to uh, uh, develop the uh, new uh, production technologies. Uh, but uh, we recognize that uh, our material development, uh, to, uh, sorry about that, <coughs> to achieve the, uh, the challenges, material development, like a new catalyst, the new ionomer, uh, membrane, etc., is very important. important. But uh, we recognize that uh, it's a competitive, a competitive field. By it, it's to be done by the OEMs. Our role, the national project law, is to accelerate the activity. So we just focus on the basic researches. Uh, basic research, meaning that <coughs> uh, mainly done by the university activity to develop a new material structure concept. Not focus on the developed material itself, but find a theological solution, how the material design will work. Uh, we also conduct in the project improving analysis technology, such as breakdown reaction process, Deterioration mechanism observe mass transfer with improving and integrated analysis technology such as stem, stem, uh, stem, stem, x ray, etc., which as the Japanese government promote such a basic research to, to with a combination uh, <coughs> collaboration with OEMs, Japanese government project will achieve the our target. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Canada is actually a major supply for the industry in this Ballard, Hydrogenics. And I think a, a lot of the fuel cell, the fuel cells themselves and the components evolved from Canada. Uh, what is, does the government have a role in, pr in promoting such uh, the industry there, knowing this is the, one of the hard cores of the Canadian industry? What is the government's role towards deploying fuel, fuel cell buses and not just the having the, the units shipped to China or around the world and deployed worldwide, but also from to be deployed locally? Do you want to say yeah, so Canada's in a funny situation in that, uh, you know, we are big exporters of fuel cells and products related to fuel cells, but we're very poor at deploying fuel cell technology in Canada itself until recently. Uh, we did run the world's largest uh, bus uh, demonstration program at Whistler with 20 buses, and we've had vehicles in uh, small numbers uh, as demonstration vehicles, but almost all of the fuel cell product in Canada was exported. That, that's starting to change. Uh, the federal government in Canada and uh, some provincial governments have put a fair bit of money into the fuel cell technology development and continue to do so, uh, both through university network uh, research projects uh, that are often in the tens of millions of dollars and through incentives for vehicle owners in some regions of the country and through investments by the federal government in, uh, in startups and other things to support them. So we have seen uh, 
growth on both fronts. In Canada, in recent months, the federal government and provincial governments have agreed to fund the development of more fueling stations. Uh, and we're migrating in Vancouver from old 350 bar to new 700 bar stations, uh, second one under construction, and, uh, and I think a couple more will be awarded uh, in the next month or so. Uh, Toronto, I think, will see its first fueling stations uh, from federal funding uh, very shortly. The government in Canada has announced a new national carbon uh, price of $50 Canadian by uh, 2030 and also announced several billion dollars for green infrastructure. And, and so these initiatives will support more infrastructure development in Canada and that will increase deployment. Canada has some real barriers. We have to compete for the few number of cars that uh, so far Japan and, uh, and Germany and others are making in Korea uh, with jurisdictions like California that have a, a regulatory incentive for people to deploy there or Scandinavia that has a tax incentive in some countries there and that sort of thing. So Canada is starting to put in place incentives and there's the beginning of a regulatory framework starting to develop where OEMs will be uh, over time compelled to uh, deploy a percentage of vehicles. Most interestingly for Canada though is the extraordinary growth in international sales of fuel cells, very dramatic. So if you think that until this year, in all of Ballard's history and Hydrogenics history, the two major fuel cell makers for bus uh, transit deployments, they probably together had maybe not more than a little over 100 buses in their entire history deployed worldwide. And China alone has ordered uh, something like 2,300 buses over the next few years, and, uh, and that, as you mentioned, the Ballard has started to deploy. The first 10 or 15 have rolled off the assembly line already. Hydrogenics is beginning. We've seen also very large growth in the uh, train set uh, interest, both in Europe with Alstom's order for France and in China. And we've seen uh, very significant increases in orders for uh, forklifts and material handling now into the many, many thousands annually, tens of thousands. So. Um, really what Canada is grappling with in the manufacturing side is ramping up manufacturing of fuel cells with all the technical issues that go with going from making a few hundred a month to thousands a month. It's not easy to do. And ramping up the, uh, the uh, consistency and durability of the fuel cell product and also at the same time uh, trying to div diversify into more areas like uh, marine and train and other areas which have perhaps had less attention. So I think you'll see a couple of phenomena. One, uh, while Japan and Korea and Germany are grappling with increasing uh, fuel cell production in, uh, at the OEM level, uh, China will very rapidly overtake all of those and start producing tens of thousands of vehicles, uh, I would expect, by the end of 2018. Uh, China is probably going to do for fuel cells what China did for wind and uh, for solar, which is create extraordinary competition for South uh, Korea, for uh, Japan, and for Germany because of their extraordinary ability to ramp up production very quickly with massive state uh, subsidization and inputs. Once China decides that if they do that fuel cell technology is a national imperative, they will invest they billions will. overnight. And so, from Canada's perspective, that means that there's, in order to remain competitive, we'll have to have partnerships with China, but we also want partnerships with other countries like, like Israel, where you have extraordinary ability in science, in fuel cells, but more importantly from our point of view, both in capital and entrepreneurship, because fuel cell development is a very entrepreneurial activity. It's not for the faint of heart. It takes a lot of capital and it takes a lot of guts. And Israel, of course, has tremendous experience in, uh, in these areas, and. And from Canada's point of view, we have uh, strong IP protection. We have a strong relationship with Israel as a longtime friend of Israel and, and longtime business partners with Israel. So we would, we would want to balance our partnerships with China with partnerships with Germany as we have with Fraunhofer or Mercedes-Benz Volkswagen with the United States as we do with DOE and others on the research side and with uh, Hyundai and Korea who are deploying vehicles into Canada now. Thank you. We need to start uh, ramping up, but I, so, so what, as for the government role, we need to invest in stations since they're non-profit, as first, like Lassie mentioned, 
and we need the tax incentive for the vehicles, but still we have the problem of the limited supply chain. Uh, how, in Germany, Klaus, can you say something about that, uh, the role of Germany in, the, in maturing the supply, the supply chain? Well, you're perfectly right. A uh, competitive uh, supply industry is key for cost reduction. Uh, I mean, the OEMs, of course, uh, need to develop and manufacture the vehicles, but they can only do that with a competitive supply base. And when uh, Japan was talking about, or san was talking about the Japanese figures, um, it's exactly what's happening. You can't ramp up fast overnight. Um, and uh, Toyota always mentions the example of the uh, hybrid technology, the Prius, uh, which started in the 1990s with low volumes. Uh, and it took them now 20 years to get to what, I think, 8 million hybrid vehicles in the market today. So the supply industry needs to be built up. Uh, what we're trying to do is, uh, I've mentioned our program, which is ending this year, the first 10 years, but the German government, uh, end of September, approved a continuation of our program for the next 10 years. And we're moving from market preparation to supporting market ramp up. Um, market ramp up is about deployment and infrastructure. Uh, it is also about continuation of R&D, uh, but it is absolutely about uh, how do we build up a competitive supply base for the key components. And that goes into manufacturing, how do you ramp up uh, production volumes, um, not only on the fuel cell side, I think hydrogen storage, hydrogen onboard storage, storage is, a, is an important topic here as well since the um, high pressure storage vessels are one of the key cost drivers in the That's vehicles right. as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you all. Sonita, you want to say something? More? Oh, uh, yeah, I think maybe just to add in terms of manufacturing, I def definitely agree and I think for those who are new to the hydrogen and fuel cell industry, um, on the infrastructure side we have you know very limited supply chains so we have um, you know, just m maybe one that nozzle su supplier, you know, one or two, one hose supplier. And we have, um, in the U.S., we've been collecting very comprehensive data on um, infrastructure. And we have a new um, website. In fact, we're offering that, you know, worldwide called h2tools.org. And uh, in terms of a one-stop shop, in safety, for instance, uh, training material, I know Japan already translated some of the material. China has been interested, uh, Korea and others. So um, in terms of offering information, that may be uh, of value to, to those in the audience. And I think um, in, in terms of safety, in terms of information sharing, whether it's compressor reliability, other station component re reliability. We track that data, but we don't have any attribution. So we don't say which company, we don't even say which country the information is coming from. So I think in terms of our role at DOE and you know, government in general, I think all of us, we're looking at how can we raise the tide so all the ships go up. So we, we really need competition. You know, we need, for this to be viable, you know, a monopoly is not going to work. So I think we need as much competition as possible and we need a you know, bigger supply chain and we have various incentives in the US in terms of manufacturing. We have a loan guarantee program. We have uh, um, national manufacturing institutes, so offering capabilities, for instance, whether it's carbon fiber, um, cost reduction facilities where you can uh, try innovative technologies. And so I think there are, there are lots of opportunities. So if, if anyone's interested in moving to the United States in manufacturing, <laughs> uh, feel free to, to contact us. But I, I definitely agree that ramping up manufacturing in the supply chain is, is critical. And I, ha I have another question. <laughs> Just one, one thing that I'm trying to, to understand why the OEMs really go into fuel cells. I mean, the, the electric vehicle, the full electric vehicle, especially with the, the reduced, dr dramatically reduced uh, battery prices, it's, it's just there. It's, it's there and it's around the corner, it's gonna get much larger. So, so on the OEM's perspective, and we don't have an OEM here, so, but I will ask you guys what you think. Uh, why would they go to, to the fuel cell? But we work really closely with the OEMs to set the DOE targets, yeah. and we have, you know, the U.S. is a, is a large country, 
And we hear constantly, well, first of all, it's not either or, so it's, it's a portfolio approach. Or, yeah. And we'll need the portfolio to get to our, our targets, which are just around the corner. And so what we hear is you get range, over 300 mile range. In fact, we validated one vehicle that was capable of up to 430 miles on just one fill. So, and the refueling time, just That's a few fine. minutes. And so, and I think as you see, you know, obviously for larger vehicles, um, the battery scales much more differently than the fuel cell. So, uh, so again, I think you see uh, market segmentation. So depending on the type of vehicle, you know, small vehicles, very short driving range, that's where a BEV may be most appropriate. Yeah. Larger vehicles, heavy duty. We have two new projects actually with FedEx and UPS for parcel delivery vans where they're interested in doubling the range um, okay. using fuel cell range extender concept. Yeah, that's so one of the concepts. So yeah. I think it's really not either or. I think they're it's recognizing that you need the portfolio, yeah, so. is my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's <laughs> range and, and fast recharging, uh, definitely. Uh, but, I mean, there's an inherent difference between a battery and a fuel cell. Um, the battery has both reactions, reactants on board, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the fuel cell sucks in the hydrogen from the environment, which gives them a gravimetric advantage when you talk about higher range. So um, there's just that uh, tipping point where, you know, what kind of physical range do you want to build into your vehicle at what cost? And if you go for larger vehicles, uh, you get to the point that uh, actually fuel cells make a lot of sense there, and that's why all major OEMs are developing this technology. And the other point is uh, on fast recharging or refueling, um, 700 bar refueling has been not only demonstrated, but is, is a reality today in almost hundreds of stations around the globe to refuel a fuel cell vehicle within three to five minutes. Uh, of course, safe, of course, very uh, convenient to the customer, and, and that's the major advantage. So, so it's moving from the diesel buses to something that is actually uh, very much alike and not like the electric buses that need long charging uh, periods. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much.